Eh, intentaremos ver cómo impulsar la, una formación de calidad, moderna, personalizada, evidentemente, adaptable, multidisciplinar, de manera que eh, manteniendo a la vez la cercanía que nos caracteriza a la Universidad de Castilla-La Mancha. Y por último, otro de los eh, ejes o líneas que vamos a trabajar en la dinámica de hoy es cómo garantizar que las metodologías de enseñanza-aprendizaje los materiales curriculares y las infraestructuras <coughs> sigan unos estándares de calidad altos y adaptables a esas necesidades futuras que pueden tener o que puedan tener nuestros estudiantes. Así que nada, bienvenidos todos de nuevo a esta jornada. Espero que sea interesante y aprovechable para todos. Y sin más, pues doy paso a, a Carlos González Morcillo, que va a, a introducir y a presentar a los ponentes de la, de la charla de hoy. Muy bien, muchas gracias, Imael. Bueno, pues recuerdo a todos los asistentes a las jornadas que existe un chat, el chat por el cual estáis viendo esta retransmisión. Podéis formular cualquier pregunta que queráis que les transmitamos a los ponentes de las jornadas. La podéis escribir en español o en inglés porque, bueno, voy a hacer de moderador y de cualquier forma, pues luego eh, elegiremos un par de preguntas y las enunciaré eh, pues de viva voz. Y nada, eh, let me switch into English to present uh, our next speaker. So they both came from Coursera. As you probably know, Coursera is the biggest uh, provider for uh, massive online open courses in the world. And Coursera has more than 80 million of active users. And they have more than 150 universities enrolled in the program that offer uh, 20,000 courses. So the numbers are incredible. And I'm uh, delighted to present you the next two speakers. First is Dr. Samar Fara, that is a skill uh, transformation consultant of Coursera. Uh, she is an educational specialist with more than 10 years of research and in online learning and programming. And she will be joined in the presentation by Adam Lewis, that is the regional manager of the skills transformation of Coursera. And they both are going to present and make the presentation, the lecture entitled Personalized Learning Empowered by e-learning, skills transformation approach. So it's a great pleasure for me to have you uh, here. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, give you the floor and uh, thank you. So my name is Adam Lewis. I, uh, I'm going to start us off with the context uh, for this presentation. And we are absolutely thrilled to be here because this is what we love to talk about. Uh, we love to talk about learning. We love to talk about skills development. So this is um, it's quite difficult to come up with an agenda that everybody would love uh, that covers everything that you want to know. So what we are going to do today is talk about um, the context of skills and skills development uh, as currently exists today. Uh, and then Samar, after I give a little bit of the skills context, is going to talk about the value of personalized learning at UCLM, uh, the principles that you need to know about quality online learning to support that, uh, and then what that might look like for students uh, who come and join any program that you're creating. Um, but as we don't know exactly what you might have come today to want to try and find out, there is a Q&A section. We are hopeful that you uh, send in any questions that you have along the way and we will try and keep it as interactive as possible. So Samar, let's, uh, let's kick this off. Um, a little bit of context because it's useful to understand the skills ecosystem that exists today before you dive down into what personalized learning means uh, and what we should be thinking about. So as you are all well aware, this is probably one of the most difficult times to be a graduate at the moment. Uh, you have two competing forces at the minute. One is automation and the other is obviously COVID-19 that are rapidly changing um, the job market that people are going into, the skills that people need to develop um, and the digitization that's happening across businesses, across governments, across universities, uh, across the world. So right now, if you are a graduate uh, in 2021, the likelihood of the skills that you will need in the workforce changing by 2025, that's only four years away, 
uh, are going to change by about 40 percent. So it's it's quite remarkable that in four years we think that the skills that workers will need will change by about 40 percent um, just in the life cycle of someone at university. So it's an enormous change that is happening in the market. It's a huge disruption to, uh, to university students and that kind of sets the context for where we are at the minute. If we look at the next slide, um, you will likely not be able to see this graph because it's very complicated, uh, but it's not, it's not a problem. What this graph on the right hand side is telling you is that there are a lot of jobs at the moment uh, that need to be filled by about 2030. And the important thing for people to realize is in that top left box of this graph, um, these are the jobs that are expected in 2030 that currently don't exist in the market. So at the moment we are teaching our students for a number of different jobs in the world and the biggest proportion of those jobs won't exist because technologies are going to advance so much. So it's a very stark warning that whenever we think about learning, when we think about skill development, when we think about the jobs and the work of the future, we have to realize that it's no longer enough to say, I'm going to have one, um, one degree for someone to have that will get me the job that is extremely linear in nature. Things are changing dramatically and we have to prepare people for that. In Spain, because clearly that's what uh, we care about in the minute, um, two million new tech jobs are going to be created by 2025. So what Samar is going to talk about in the future uh, is about how if you look at jobs that students are going to go into uh, and then by backwards design start to work out what skills people need to develop. Uh, this is a very good analysis. So the analysis on the left was done by Microsoft, um, which says actually about 80 percent of the new jobs that are going to be created by 2025 are going to be digital and the increase in the number of digital jobs that are going to be created in these areas, software development, cloud, data, AI, cybersecurity is enormous. So you can see these light blue bars on the left. The light blue bars uh, tell you the current jobs in these areas at the moment and the dark blue bars show you how many more additional jobs are going to come in these specific regions. So so even in Spain, uh, as you're looking at the ecosystem of what kind of skills need to be developed, we need to start thinking about how we get people the skills that are required to do these jobs. And on the right hand side, again, it's a little bit fuzzy, but hopefully you can see it. Um, this is by the World Economic Forum uh, in their future jobs report last year, which looks at the emerging jobs that are coming in the Spanish market. Um, and it may be surprising but the top emerging job here is an Internet of Things specialist. So I don't know about you, but uh, I don't know many people who go to university to become an Internet of Things specialist. Not many people go to university to become uh, an AI or a big data specialist either. So what we're finding is that people will come into the university market they will see a bunch of jobs that exist in the market that are very different from the world that exists today and somehow we need to bridge the gap to try and get them there. So on the next slide, um, the challenge for universities is obviously extremely uh, hard, right? Uh, universities need to adapt and innovate to equip students with the jobs of the future. So everything you're doing today uh, gives people the core skills that they need but that 40% of skills that are going to change over time, we need to try and bridge that gap as well. Um, and if you look at this analysis um, on, again, the World Economic Forum, they said when they interviewed companies and said, why is it difficult to adopt new technologies uh, within your markets? The biggest reason is skill gaps. So we need to try and fix these skill gaps. Um, extremely relevant to Spain because there's obviously uh, high youth unemployment at the moment. And as people need to get higher qualifications to get these skills and these jobs, um, we need to be able to bridge to help them to get there. So that kind of provides a little bit of context on the nature of the ecosystem within which we're working. It's highly varied. It's very difficult to prepare people for the skills that they need unless you have uh, a very forward thinking approach, which obviously UCLM 
uh, has by bringing us here and by having these conversations. The other aspect of this that's really important, because we are going to talk about personalised learning, is that it's not just digital skills that are required. It's also these human skills that actually enable people to move to the future of work. So we are uh, a very academic based organisation. Um, so we love to read the latest trends from professors about the future of work. Uh, Heather McGowan is a professor on the future of work. She's written a wonderful book called The Adaptation Advantage, if anyone wants to go and read it. Uh, she's also contributed to the Future of Work course on Coursera. And her view is that we're moving from a <clears throat> multidisciplinary world where people used to have very narrow skill sets. Um, and when you went into the working world, you would do that narrow skill set and you'd work likely with other people as well into what we're calling a transdisciplinary world, which is where humans and machines work together, um, where actually you're no longer required to have one skill set but you need to be able to work with lots of different people in lots of different capacities with technology. OK, so every single job in the future will have one of these little robots with it that is the AI world that we live in or data uh, or you know, software that we're using. And we need to prepare our students to not only be able to work with that technology and software, but also to be able to collaborate with lots of other people across the world who are also using their own technologies and their softwares. Um, and so their ability to learn and adapt um, is going to be critical. So a lot of what you hear from us is going to be about uh, digital skills because they're critical for future jobs, but it's also about the human skills that allow people to collaborate in a very different working world, which is obviously remote, uh, quite challenging, uh, and requires a level of learning that we probably have never seen before. So when we think about the essential skills that we need to think about, um, here is just a selection of the skills when we as Coursera uh, talk to governments and we talk to universities and we talk to businesses, we generally talk about. Okay, We talk about software development, cloud, data, cybersecurity, and all of the human skills that sit underneath it. And the real question that you have to ask um, that Samar is going to help us with is you as a university, if we know that these are the skills that you need to be thinking about, as well as all of the core curriculum that you offer today, what can we do to get there? How do we actually design learning programs that prepare people from a highly varied skill set uh, that they're going to need in the future? So I'm going to hand over to Samar, who is hopefully going to answer that question for us. No pressure. Thank you, Adam. Uh, hi, everyone. It's really uh, a, a real pleasure to be here with you today and to be able to have this conversation with you and and engage in such an important uh, discussion. So, uh, you know, what I'll be covering in the next uh, set of slides is really trying to think um, uh, more con contextualized um, for your university and what this means, um, whether it's, you know, how to how to design a more personalized uh, learning environment and also uh, for the student what that means, you know, what are the benefits and, and, and how to make use of something like this. So personalized learning is, is not a new concept. It's been around since the 80s uh, and it's something that um, has become a little bit more popular in recent years with the transition to the online space and the use of technology uh, naturally and, and the use of AI and we'll talk about that. But it applies just as much to the face to face environment. Um, and the idea here is is transitioning from a more teacher or faculty centered um, learning experience to one that that places the student at the center. And, you know, I think we all like to think that that's how learning is, but I think uh, realistically, unfortunately, it, it's not always the case or or at least not enough. And so what does that mean in reality if we're talking about, you know, a personalized learning experience, particularly given what we've heard Adam share about about the context in which, you know, uh, those of you who are students today will be graduating and, and entering that world uh, relatively soon. So the three things that, you know, the, in our mind are crucial uh, when we're thinking about this are first offering a breadth of skills. So, you know, 
as we know, uh, the, the traditional, you know, academic uh, program doesn't always provide a lot of flexibility for this, um, you know, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and now what will be needed around the transdisciplinary um, skills development opportunity. So providing those opportunities, that, that breadth of skills so that the students uh, get to explore and build a broader set of skills that will prepare them for the future. The second one is around providing hands-on learning experiences. So, you know, the theory is great and important, but what we're hearing from employers is that the hands-on learning uh, experiences, the application of that theory is really crucial for uh, a student to, to be well prepared for the workplace and, you know, also to understand and explore uh, what are the things that they're passionate about uh, without, uh, without really having to complete a full degree before really understanding what that means in reality. And the third is around uh, using all of these things that I've just described to create a flexible pathway or a learning opportunity. And so that involves, you know, having a self-paced, um, you know, model of learning where the student really does it um, at their own pace uh, based on their specific needs and where they really want to go. And using all of that to really complement um, the, the strong academic experience that they're receiving at the university. And, and before moving on to the next point, I think the important piece to mention here is, is we are focusing on the student, but that doesn't mean that there's not an important role to play for the faculty or for the staff at a university. In fact, you know, we would argue that that they play an even more central role and more active role because, it, you know, in the traditional, I guess, model, um, it, it's it, their engagement is with the group, uh, you know, um, and and in this way they provide a more, um, it, you know, their role is more of a mentor and a guide and a facilitator of this learning experience for every individual um, student. And we'll talk about what that really means in reality as well. So, so when we talk about the breadth of skills, um, you know, as Adam mentioned, it's it's really crucial for a learner to be versatile and to have those, you know, broad set of skills. Um, digital and human are really, you know, uh, where where the future is going to be. So regardless of, you know, whether a student uh, is enrolled in the humanities or the social sciences, or even in some of the, you know, the, the, the tech uh, fields, uh, they're, they're it is really crucial for them to have that, um, you know, that that growth mindset and that opportunity to really know how to interact in cross-functional teams um, uh, by really having an awareness of a lot of other skills and and um, and areas of expertise. And and when we talk about uh, the the hands-on learning experiences, you know, things like lab assignments uh, where, you know, uh, you know, say someone is, is studying a computer science degree, you know, having the opportunity to do a lot of these, you know, the labs um, within the course um, and, and to really practice what they're learning or someone who's studying business or say, you know, um, uh, communications to really apply um, you know, uh, they're learning in a real world scenario uh, through through concrete projects and they can ap apply what they're learning um, has really been found to um, allow a student to um, identify their passions and really um, be better prepared for the workplace. And so these are some examples of, you know, some of the things that we're thinking about and, and exploring and making available to students. And, and when we think about the flexibility of, you know, of designing, you know, a learning pathway uh, for an individual student, the important thing to, to think about is to start with the end in mind, you know, so uh, what are the student's individual needs and where do they want to go and, and create that guided, um, guided instruction or, or guided opportunity to design that program for them. Um, regardless of, of, you know, what they want to pursue. So, you know, um, we are seeing a lot of um, new career paths that are emerging, a lot of which, you know, we are even unfamiliar with. And so it would be important to offer those skills development opportunities for a student to really um, build on what they have um, in, their, in their current academic uh, environment 
to develop those additional skills that will help them become specialists in certain areas. So, you know, as Adam mentioned, you know, nobody really goes to university to uh, become an Internet of Things specialist or, you know, um, uh, someone in, you know, I don't know, smart cities, for example. But that's where the additional skills opportunities can really help to build up those areas of expertise and really differentiate the student from uh, others that are going to be applying for similar jobs. And so here's just an example of what something like that would look like. And obviously in the online learning setting, that becomes a lot easier, you know, because a student can really um, do some courses online, incorporated with what they're learning in the classroom, um, with their faculty, and and really, you know, manage that experience on their own. So, you know, take the example of Juan, who is, you know, 20 years old. He's he's studying in the humanities um, in, in the humanities faculty, but he wants to pursue uh, digital marketing. It's something that he's realized he's passionate about. So he can take a set of courses, you know, that really complement whatever degree he's doing in the humanities it, you know in this in this case um, with this model it doesn't actually really matter what what his actual degree is because you can um, you can um, uh, supplement and and stack up additional skill sets on top of the degree that they're getting um, in order to make sure that he would be qualified for those kinds of jobs. So he can take a digital marketing specialization, some uh, courses around social media from Facebook um, and and uh, practice some of these hands on learning experiences on you know, how to apply search engine optim optimization using different kinds of uh, platforms. And similarly, the human skills we can't forget. Uh, we you know we know that they are crucial. So thinking about what are some of these human skills that would be relevant to this type of role for him, uh, things like design thinking and critical thinking in the in the information age and, and in the digital context would be really uh, valuable to his experience. So this is just one example of such a pathway that could be created uh, for any student that would complement what they're learning as well. And for students that you know may not have an idea of what they want to pursue. Personalized learning really gives them an opportunity to explore that and the flexibility to really um, be creative in, in uh, you know, in testing different things and hopefully identifying things that they're passionate about. And, and one of the things, you know, that we are seeing that's that's really changing, changing the scenario significantly is the, the use of artificial intelligence in the education space. And as you'll see here in this um, in this table, uh, the use of um, the investments in artificial intelligence in the field of you know, education, you'll see students courses at tech and English language has grown significantly over the past uh, year. We don't have the latest data of this year, but I'm sure it's going to be even even higher. And and its applicability to you know designing these personalized pathways is very relevant. So you know some of the ways in which, in which it's relevant is um, in, in during assessments. So you know. Um, automating using you know AI informed technology to um, automate um, uh, student feedback and to provide some of these more personalized responses that the faculty member could then um, spend more time on the more nuanced discussions and analysis of you know how to apply learning um, and and what does it mean for for the student uh, similarly artificial intelligence is used to analyze data and to support with you know assessment and tracking on a larger you know, on a larger scale and to support um, student development as well. And so there, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of um, opportunities for faculty to uh, to perhaps be relieved of some of the um, more administrative um, activities that they would have been doing so far, but also use this data to inform how they support the students, which can be really powerful. And and I think this is this is a good place to um, to talk about you know with this transition to um, teaching online, particularly over the past year, that nobody was prepared for. Um, it is really important to think about the fact that um, underpinning all of this is the quality of the educational experience, and and you know it is really crucial for you know any any such you know personalized learning. Uh, approach or model to to really be um, fundamentally based in 
you know, high quality teaching and particularly if it's done online. And, you know, because of this transition over the past year, a lot of faculty have not been, you know, have not received the sufficient training, the sufficient support to really adjust to this new model, which really isn't about, you know, taking what you were doing in person and, and applying it online. It, it's much more complicated than that. Um, and so we wanted to share with you just a few principles that we have learned over the past, you know, um, number of years uh, supporting students online um, that help to guide, you know, what are really the ways in which we can um, ensure students are engaged, uh, ensure that students have the right outcomes and are developing the set of skills that they need, um, ensure students are motivated, and ensure that they achieve the right career outcomes, which ultimately is, is why we're all here. And the first point is we're seeing that faculty are the most important. You know, just because we're using technology, that does not at all mean that, you know, the faculty member um, is any less important. In fact, what we're seeing is that they are the strongest driver of student satisfaction. And the second driver of student satisfaction is the use of videos. And videos are critical to ensure student engagement, uh, but we are seeing that, you know, videos are longer than 10 minutes long, will really lose a student, you know, and I'd say anyone as well. Um, so hopefully you are still engaged in this conversation. Um, and, and, and we are also seeing that early engagement in courses really helps to increase completion. So whether it's uh, using discussion boards or having, you know, some opportunities for students to interact together or interact with a faculty member really allows them to, um, to, to complete um, at a higher rate. The third point is around application, and we've already talked about this. Um, uh, as as the student applies what they're learning, we are seeing that they are 30% um, more likely to develop those skills in that area, which is really which is really significant. And even more um, powerful than that is ensuring that the student is challenged enough. So you obviously don't want to um, you know make the content too difficult. Uh, but you also don't want it to be uh, too easy. And, and that right level, that right balance, I think can only be found, you know, with the support of the faculty member to ensure that a student is really um, developing the skills at the right pace. And finally, the links to jobs. So we are seeing from our experience that 80% of students that enroll in uh, business tech or data courses report concrete career outcomes. And that's, that's really crucial because that means that they are learning the right things that they need for uh, success in their professional lives and, and hopefully their personal lives as well. So what does what does all of that mean from the perspective of the student, right? Um, you know, it's it's clear. Uh, it may be very obvious that well, you know, obviously the student stands to benefit, but uh, it is always helpful to look at it from their perspective. And, you know, there are a number of ways in, in which they benefit. Accessing, engaging, and relevant content to them um, as individuals, uh, being able to track their progress, and this is uh, I'll share I'll share you know um, some examples to, to illustrate what that would potentially look like. Uh, being able to remain motivated as they're going through the learning experience by developing new skills, and and ultimately uh, what it all goes down to is is finding the job. As Adam shared, you know the context currently um, is very difficult. And so I think students are under a lot of pressure and we hear this from a lot of universities to really just focus on employability. But really, you know, how are they supposed to, um, you know, identify the way in which they can get to a specific job uh, can be quite confusing for them. And so um, I would like to share with you just one of the ways in which we've been trying to think about how to how to better design this learning experience and that could help you um, really see personalized learning um, in, in a concrete way. So one of the one of the things that we've been trying to develop is what we call academies. And in this case, you know, we're taking the example of a data science academy. And what this involves is around, um, as I just said, identifying the set of skills that an individual, in this case, a student would need to get to a specific job. You know, what is that learning pathway that they need um, uh, in order to get there. And uh, there are a number of different pathways that we've created as part of this academy for people who are in employment already, people in leadership and uh, positions who have specific functions, um, and for the average person. But if you take a look at the top player around the roles, 
if if say you know um, you as a student one of you would like to become a data scientist well you may be you know studying uh, computer science or you may be studying one of your engineering programs or perhaps even something else you know it, it doesn't necessarily have to be one of these very technical skills the idea here is that you could then create a pathway um, that will prepare you for this kind of a role um, and and we've done this using the data that we have as a platform um, because we do collect a lot of insights from our interactions with uh, with companies and so that helps us really understand what are some of the pathways that you know an individual can develop and in terms of the student learning experience um, you know we if you've identified what are the set of skills that you need um, in order to um, to to become say uh, you know a, a, a software engineer in this case, um, or a data scientist as we've just discussed, you'll see on the right hand side the individual skills that are listed and what would be offered to you is a personalized um, set of courses depending on your level of proficiency um, and, and where you're at in each of the skills. And you would have a set of targets that you would see improve as you go through your courses so you really are motivated by knowing that you are um, developing your skills as you go along and these courses will adjust based on um, your level of proficiency in your in your learning. So this really allows you to have a very personalized skills development journey and um, and you know whether it's using something like this or as I've just shared you know creating a pathway with the support of, of faculty and identifying the right set of skills that are needed in order to achieve a certain goal are all you know different types of examples of how a personalized um, learning journey can be designed for a student but what's crucial from apologies for this i will just skip through it since we've already talked about it um and and what's crucial from the from the university perspective is also being able to track the skills of you know these learners and to be able to support them in in that experience so you know some of the things that we do in our case is really tracking um, skills by different proficiencies and that is all something that as you begin to um, uh, to to offer these pathways and to develop these skills um, the skills development opportunities for students uh, you would be able to track all of that data and to support the students in that experience so just to conclude, um, you know, just wanted to review what we've what we've discussed. First, skills are changing rapidly. Digital and human skills are really crucial for anyone, regardless of what they're going to be studying. Second, the personalized learning experience is really about empowering students to explore and pursue the pathways that you know are are of interest to them. And third, when it comes to uh, you know the university, so University of Castilla La Mancha. Um, you can support students in this process of personalized learning by complementing what you're already offering with flexible skills development opportunities and hands-on learning experiences. And to be successful with this whole experience, online learning has to be of high quality. It has to be rooted in strong pedagogy, strong design and relevance for the students. And finally, for students, as, as we know, the priority is really finding that job and gaining those skills for work. So what are what are the ways in which we need to do, you know, what are the ways uh, we need to do to uh, to ensure that they can get to that place? Because ultimately it is about the student. And so um, that um, that is what we should all be focused on. Um, that's everything for us. So we'd be happy to take any questions uh, from the audience. Uh, and may, maybe if I could just jump in here, because I, I have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask you, Samar, first, and then we could potentially go across. Sure. Because we, we've talked about the uh, jobs first approach that um, we need to understand the jobs that people may be going into. Uh, we need to understand how we actually develop the skills to get people to those jobs. What are universities doing at the moment? to help students to decide on the jobs of the future. Like what are we seeing from a Coursera perspective uh, to help people to get there? Well, I would say not enough. Um, and so I think there's a lot of um, room, um, room to do more. 
Uh, I think, you know, the, the links between universities and industry are, are you know, not as strong as, as they could be where universities can be providing those additional skills. But we are seeing a lot of universities, in particular over the past years, uh, over the past year, um, being much more aware of the need to do more. And so there are a number of ways in which universities are trying to provide these additional skills development opportunities. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, offering more content online, um, uh, you know, through different providers, but also really trying to, um, you know, explore these hands-on learning opportunities um, and and really thinking about what are what are we really teaching our students and how does it apply to reality? So um, they are starting to think about all of these things and 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 really trying to. Um, Think about the end goal, uh, I guess, and 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 work work their way backwards from there as to as to where students need to go. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. The, uh, the the really interesting part about the hands-on learning that potentially we might come to in a little more detail is that uh, the more projects that people do, the more people get hands-on with the type of skills that they might be developing, the more they start to understand jobs, uh, the more they start to understand where they might want to head. So I think um, one of the things we've definitely seen as universities complement their own curriculum uh, with online learning and with this hands on learning is that it gives students the opportunity from a personalized perspective to just test and play. And you know, we know from a pedagogical standpoint, if you play, you learn extremely well. Um, so if you uh, go into a project and try and understand what data analysis looks like in a marketing world um, all of a sudden you start to understand what a job might look like in that world uh, the more you start to play with data science and artificial intelligence in a very easy hands-on environment the more you start to understand what your opportunities might be to then find roles in the future once you leave university so i think the complementation of your current curriculum uh, with real hands-on learning and you know short bite-sized content that gets people to open their minds about what's possible and what they could learn on top of what they're learning already uh, is, is something that we found to be extremely uh, extremely powerful uh, and helps people to then then design their own skill platforms and their own learning paths so hopefully that that just helps with a little bit of uh, more context around that as well okay. Carlos, I'm uh, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted your Q&A, so I'll, I'll hand back to you if you've got other questions for us. So thank, thank you very much. So mute my microphone so I can. Yeah, perfect. So thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. So we have some questions from the audience. I'm going to ask you first. So. Uh, the first question said, how could we embed the open education strategy within overall institutional strategy? Yeah, I, I was just saying, I assume we're talking about how to incorporate more online learning um, broadly into, into teaching at the university, is that right? Mm, I'm not sure if the question is, how can we incorporate this open education yeah, within the strategy of the university. Okay, I, I'm How happy to open to content and open learning and okay. whatever. Sure. So I would say, you know, um, I, I actually ended up uh, skipping one slide by mistake. So maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, what I'd included there. Um, online learning is here to stay, you know, in some shape or form, whether it's, you know, um, incorporating blended learning, so the combination of face to face and online or, you know, some components being fully online, um, depending on the needs of the learner and, you know, the strategy of any university. Uh, the important thing to think about is, you know, with with online learning, we are seeing the research show that uh, actually the combination of both um, produces the best outcomes for students when it comes to learning. So really a student that, that learns in a combination of, of blended and, and um, online and face-to-face -face, um, learns the most, uh, but obviously it has to be rooted in you know, doing it effectively. And I think the difficulty over the past year is to, is to uh, use that time to make the assumption that 
whatever has happened over the past year is a reflection of what it would actually look like if it were designed effectively. And, and I don't think it's fair to use the past year towards that because, as I said, faculty were not prepared, the, the universities were not prepared, and the students were not prepared either. And so I think it has to be um, a really structured and well-informed strategy about um, how it's used that would be complemented with uh, professional development opportunities and, um, and, and really um, a, a clear plan of, of where it makes sense. And so some of the things that we tried to illustrate today is, is you know, for some of these skills, the developing skills of the future, um, you know, those digital skills that actually um, become outdated within, you know, two to five years sometimes, it, teaching them online is actually really effective because you're able to refresh that content. Um, you, can, uh, you can draw on content that already exists and you don't have to create that yourselves all the time. Um, and which allows you to focus on, you know, other areas of expertise um, and, and that student engagement that really will complement uh, the learning of some of these, you know, core topics or emerging topics <clears throat> um, that are, <clears throat> sorry, that, that come up very often. So I think it has to be a, a really um, well thought out strategy, but it's, it's very much where we're seeing most universities transition to these days. Um, and, and that really will ensure that uh, the learners are best equipped to adjust to the, to the new reality of, of work. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that, Adam. No, I think it's a great answer. Um, I, would, I would add one thing, which is to say that um, there are quite a lot of skills taxonomies out there now. Uh, we have our own that we use, which identifies the core skills of the future. Um, and and putting that alongside what's being taught at the moment. So to say, this is the curriculum we teach at the minute. Um, these are the skills of the future and seeing where the overlap lies, seeing where there are uh, potential gaps in the curriculum or areas where you could develop the curriculum further uh, is very useful to strategically then think about what you might want to offer additional to what you're offering today. Um, so I would, I would definitely look to identify uh, that kind of skills taxonomy uh, for the future of work and for the future of uh, university graduates. And the, the next stage, the stage that, that we've done with quite a lot of universities is then to say, OK, well, for each degree, what is the relevant future skill set that people might want to add on um, that we can then supplement it? So it might be a different set of uh, content that you're providing for engineers as uh, for business students. It might be different for a liberal arts student who might want to go into a slightly different career. So I think you start with the skills taxonomy uh, and look at where you can develop in the future. Then you look at uh, specifically for your different schools uh, of thought. Um, and then as you get more mature, and we're seeing this with quite a few universities that we've worked with for quite a long time, uh, you can then start to innovate around the edges to offer this multidisciplinary piece uh, from an engineering school on the one hand and a business school on the other to, to kind of work together as well. So I think that, that just hopefully identifies a few steps that you can take to, to get there. So next I'm going to ask you another question from the audience. Luis asked to, I think that these two questions are closely related, so I'm going to ask you in one, just in one, in one question. Luis says, uh, is Coursera evaluating the European Union's approach to micro credentials? And the second question that I think is closely related, what steps are being taken to standardize the description of content so that skills, competencies, mm -hmm. etc., to enable global recognition. So what is the Coursera's opinion of this approach? OK, I can I can do the first one, Adam, you can take the second one. Sounds good. OK, so on the first point, it's something that um, that is raised um, in some of our conversations with the universities. To be completely honest, the way we think about it at Coursera is we're not um, 
we're not a university, you know, um, we are a facilitator of access to great content offered by, you know, leading institutions. And so we um, leave it up to the universities to determine how they want to use the content on our platform or whether it's content that they combine with their own um, with their own offerings, which most universities do, to be honest. Um, to design, you know, say a micro credential or to stack it up to form something that they would recognize as as as, you know, uh, being equivalent to X credits or to, uh, you know, um, uh, some sort of a credential or partial degree. So in, in our opinion, you know, that is something that we like to leave open to any institution, depending on what their context is, what the accreditation uh, guidelines are in their country, because we understand that it is a very complex um, environment and it actually varies by region. Um, and so we, we are not um, we don't want to place those kinds of restrictions um, on any institution or country. So I hope that helps. And I'm happy to take the second question, uh, which is about standardizing competencies. Uh, it's such a live conversation. Uh, it is not easy. Let's put it that way. Um, so I think the, the easy answer to say is that the more that um, different providers or different organizations start to understand the skills that are being developed in the ecosystem, uh, the more there is overlap between them on on what kind of skills are being developed. So just as an example, um, the World Economic Forum uh, does its future of job reports, which comes out uh, every year, and it uses the Coursera data to identify the skills that people are learning. It uses uh, data from LinkedIn. Uh, it uses data from Burning Glass, which is about job reports. So um, what's naturally happening is that the biggest providers of these kind of taxonomies are coming together in forums like the World Economic Forum, the OECD, um, to be able to try and speak one language. Um, I think eventually in time, we will get to a stage where one language is kind of adopted uh, in, in a much broader sense by the wider community. But I think for now, um, what we're seeing is that we have a lot of confidence in our skills taxonomy because there are 80 million people using it. Uh, we have a lot of confidence because we can then match it up um, to places like the World Economic Forum. Um, but I think, I think the more that we interact with governments and universities and businesses, uh, the more you'll start to see a bit of a standardization, I think, naturally happen because providers are working together and universities are working together and governments are working together. Um, so I think we're on the journey. We're early in the journey. Um, but I think the natural path is that there will be some sort of standardization. But if you um, if the, the question from the person who asked the question is that uh, they want to find out more about skills taxonomies, then that's a, an entirely different conversation that we could have and very welcome to do so. So thank you. So I I have like last last question. So I really like in your presentation the term. So this is the first time I've I've heard transdisciplinary. So the how the human and the artificial intelligence converse. And you also mentioned the learning agility. And I think that this is connected with learning analytics. The question is that in one slide, I, I can remember the number of the slide, but uh, Samar says something about the fourth principle for uh, teaching or for learning, I don't know. And in mm -hmm. one, you said uh, hands-on learning and how the content must must be challenging. So the question is, uh, do you use the analytics uh, to measure the engagement of the students and then try to create a content that follow a principle of scaffolding? So how to create content that has exactly the level of complexity that the student needs or provide different ways inside a course. So for example, if the content is quite easy for the student, then some part of the content can be hide and the student can skip this content and go to a more challenging uh, content or the course is tightly follow step by step and doesn't matter the, the input level of, of the student. Mm -hmm. Adam, I'll let you take yeah, that. Yeah, I, I can start. So 
Um, so first of all, to say uh, we have an entire teaching and learning function within Coursera full of uh, learning designers, researchers and scientists who pour over all of this data with our data science team. Um, so the simple answer is yes. We look at our analytics deeply to understand what happens with learners and and the report that Samar was mentioning is our uh, drivers of online quality. You can download that right now on the internet uh, and look at it and it gives you um, great analytics about uh, the impact of different levers within online education. So what happens when you put a programming assignment in at the very beginning of a course? What happens uh, if you get people to do a discussion forum? What happens if a course is 10 weeks long versus two weeks long? Um, so you get these kind of answers and that directly goes into how we then develop courses with our partners and universities. So, for example, um, we know the the best amount of time for a video. Uh, we know the best amount of uh, length for a specific course. We know that if you put a programming assignment in the first week of activity, there is a higher chance that someone will then complete that course if they do it. So there are lots of little initiatives that you can do along the way when you design a program that will allow people to continue along the journey because ultimately that's you know the biggest difficulty of of online learning is you need to be disciplined yourself to do it. So there are lots of little nudges that you can get uh, across the board with the design of the program and then also artificial intelligence nudges to ping people at the right moment to say, oh, you're 40% of your way through this course. If you get to 60%, 90% of learners then complete the course. So you can give all of this information directly to learners and that allows them um, to then advance uh, along the program. So, so I think the, the big advantage uh, of online at the moment is, is you get all of this data. You also get the skills data. So I think the question talks a little bit about um, the skills that people are developing. So we can tell from our data, every single course on Coursera has assessments in every single module. So an assessment is designed um, using an, an ELO model. I don't, I don't know if people are familiar with it, but it essentially says if, if you do an assessment and you pass it straight away, then your skill score increases quite dramatically. If you take three times to complete an assessment because you keep failing, your score will only go up a little bit. So there's a lot of work you can do to get machine learning models to then analyze the actual skill development that people have, um, which then gives us the ability to say, OK, your student at the moment is at a beginner level here, an intermediate level here or an advanced level here. And for them to get in a specific role or to get a certain skill set, uh, they need to get to a specific target. So you can start to play around with all of these proficiencies in a way that, um, you know, I, I used to do some teaching in the past that, you know, I would only dream of as a teacher to be able to get access to some of this data. Um, so it gives us the ability to really assess skills and then um, and then change the quality of the course uh, associated with that. So as you as you know, we are a face to face university and yeah, some of the future jobs are closely related with technology. So how can we uh, apply this? Uh, so how can, how can we introduce this kind of content in traditional careers? that have not traditionally used, so for example, art or humanities, but from the point of view of the face-to-face -face learning, so not giving just the, the online approach. So you told us that the, the academics must follow a, an, a role as a kind of, uh, yeah, to, to give the way for the students, but probably not the content, but how this can be applied in a face-to-face -face, uh, teaching activity. So in a face-to-face -face university like, like uh, the UCLM. Mm -hmm. uh, I, can, I can start and Adam, if you'd like to add. Sure. Um, I think everything that we've discussed applies just as much to online as it does to face-to-face -to -face when it comes to you know, the importance of offering these skills for the students and doing it in a personalized 
manner. Uh, you know, this isn't something that um, that should necessarily be different across these two modalities. The question, I'm really sorry, I live next to a school, it's really noisy. Um, the, the question is, you know, how to, as you said, how to incorporate that. And there's a lot of, you know, there's there's actually a lot more learning and a lot more research about how to how to engage students and how to do so effectively in the face-to-face -face experience. So, you know, I, I think applying that in, in a face-to-face -face model wouldn't necessarily be difficult. It's about, you know, it's about off figuring out how to offer that content, whether you would want to offer some components of this content online, so it would be a blended approach, or, you know, bringing in, for example, bringing in people from uh, industry to speak to students, to talk about the workplace, to talk about specific roles, or, you know, um, bringing students together with um, experts within your faculty um, who can talk about their own experiences, who can um, maybe delve deeply into a specific skill set or a topic that they have that, um, you know, students outside of that faculty may not typically be able to access. Maybe it's about um, uh, ma making your um, curriculum a little bit more flexible where students can take a lot more courses in other faculties to complement their learning that they already have within their own faculty. And, you know, offering them maybe a little bit of the academic support, say, you know, if you have an English student that wants to take a programming course, they may need uh, you know, to be a part of a working group or a student group to provide that peer support as they take a programming course because it's something new to them and, and they're not used to it and they don't have a technical background. So there's many different ways to think about how to structure the learning um, in a face-to-face -face environment that would ultimately, you know, result in the same, uh, in the same outcomes um, or that could be complemented with the, with the online experience. So I don't necessarily see it as, uh, as being a challenge. Uh, I think the key point is that, you know, the online learning space moves very quickly and provides access, as we as we said, to um, a breadth of content that is now available um, at anyone's fingertips. Um, and that's really refreshed on a very regular basis. And then you've got a lot of the analytics that make that uh, quite easy and appealing. Um, also from the administrator or the university perspective, but it, but it's all possible to do in either modality. Yeah, I, I completely agree, and I, I think that blended learning model, um, if if you want to see a practical, I mean, right now, I, I did a, a master's a few years ago, and you know, I have a textbook in front of me. We were watching videos from online, YouTube videos, you know, so a vast majority of the learning that I was doing was being brought from lots of different uh, angles and lots of different uh, providers. It, it can be very similar here, so we've seen uh, faculty who will say go and take this one course as part of you know the, the teaching that we're doing at the moment and we'll come back and talk about it uh, and have a lot of facilitation sessions or it could be that faculties uh, that kind of uh, professors might come along and say well uh, I'm going to use parts of this course within uh, my actual teaching as well in the same way as you might use part of a textbook or part of something else so I think the blended approach gives you the flexibility to do different things from that perspective. But Samar's right. I mean, we've seen when when Coursera is offered um, to humanity students uh, and to you know the liberal arts, what you find is that a lot of courses just across the board are being taken from a multidisciplinary perspective um, that often the faculty weren't expecting. So the faculty might say, hey, I really want you to take this content and then they'll find that the students are taking that content, but also a whole range of other content that gives them uh, a breadth of learning that gets them excited about learning and is bringing different disciplines into the classroom, which can only be a good thing. Um, so I think it doesn't matter whether it's a technical job that you're looking for or whether it's um, a humanities that we're looking at. Uh, there are opportunities for everyone to bring uh, content from Coursera into your university in whichever style you want and we've seen it in every which way from lots of universities so we're uh, happy to talk to you about it if you if you want to uh, find out a little bit more about the different options. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation so we like really a lot it will be very helpful for the working day 
on the definition of the digital strategy of the university. So let me switch again into Spanish because I'm going to give some information for this working day. And um, thank you very much for coming. It's been a great pleasure for us to have you here. And for for the rest of the members of the uh, digital strategy group. And bueno, pues eh, continuaremos con las jornadas a las once y media. Igual que en la primera jornada nos tendremos que conectar al, a la reunión Teams, a todos los que estáis convocados, al grupo general y desde allí nuestro dinamizador hará indicaciones para ir entrando en cada uno de los grupos de trabajo. Si alguno de los asistentes quisiera unirse a esa jornada de trabajo de la estrategia digital, que ponga un mensajito ahora en el, en el chat eh, para que le podamos añadir o, o bien que nos escriba un correo electrónico a la cuenta de correo del eh, vicerrectorado de Transformación Estrategia Digital y le, y le añadimos a las, a las jornadas. Y nada más, pues muchas gracias por vuestra atención y nos vemos el miércoles que viene en la última sesión de la definición de la estrategia digital de la universidad que tendrá que ver con eh, digitalización. Pues muchas gracias. Thank you.